Ah, good morning, everyone. Hello. Um, so, diving a little bit further into some um, specifics about a particular working group that has been started uh, over the course of the last year at the IETF. Strange noises. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of a chat with you about stub network auto configuration, uh, as I think this is exceptionally relevant to some of you in the room, uh, in particular those of you who are actively putting CPE out there into people's homes and, and hope to connect them up with things. So, a stub network, it's a very simple concept. Effectively, what we're looking at here is you have your pretty typical home LAN, Wi-Fi fixed, Ethernet network. Um, and in the case of stub networks here, from the context of the working group, they refer to these as infrastructure networks or adjacent infrastructure networks. And a stub network is typically something that is um, behind another router, so a sort of cascading router, another type of device that's routing packets in and out somewhere else in the home. And I was actually looking at this and I was thinking, we used to call these things gateways, I'm sure. But for the purpose of this now, we, we call them stub networks and stub routers. So the challenges here, um, connecting devices to your home Wi-Fi is really simple. You know, we make this work all day, every day. It's how we get people on the internet. Connecting another network to a network, to your infrastructure network, actually quite difficult. And there are some complexities there, in particular around reachability and discoverability um, that aren't currently being solved particularly well. So, I mean, if you were going to do this with IPv6, how would you do it? Would you bridge it into the other network? Would you use NAT? Would you use MPT? I'm not sure all of these things work particularly well. Well, they all have concerns, uh, in particular, creating very large layer two domains, just recipe for pain. Any of you who've ever done, uh, I think perhaps if you've ever used WSL uh, on your Windows machines, or if you've ever used uh, Hyper-V or you know, VirtualBox or any of these things, I mean, you will have had issues with connectivity in and out one way or the other. There'll be some issue that you can, you can probably think of. And even in IPv4 land, I think um, you know, the idea of putting double NAT in there, um, I think the working group agrees with me in this particular case, it's complex. It, it, it has uh, you know, overheads in terms of manageability, having cascading port forwarding. Um, I don't think the discovery of devices uh, or services is not really going to work on those stub networks. So we don't really have that reachability in between the two. And it's worth remembering here as well we're not necessarily talking about extra Ethernet networks. They might be, but they might also be uh, threads. Uh, they might be Zigbee networks. Could even be Bluetooth networks in some fashion. So we should consider here as well that traditional paradigms that we have with uh, you know, in maybe internal virtual networking or something like that, as I mentioned before, they're not necessarily going to apply. So. The IETF obviously does a lot of work. Obviously, Tim's been through quite a bit um, of it, and that's just the stuff that kind of touches on IPv6. There's absolutely tons of things going on. Anyone can submit documents to the IETF, but you know, anyone can contribute if they want to. But when we want to create documents of a very high quality, we tend to end up forming a formal structure known as a working group to be able to look at those things um, with a, a defined process. And in the case of the SNAC working group, um, I think it was understood in particular that the underlying concept here is not particularly well standardized, and the, the working group's obviously been formed upon that, but it was also very keenly pointed out that a lot of the documents that will need to be created potentially get created in different working groups. So there's a lot of this interworking between working groups that does go on on a regular basis. But beginning in July 22, um, and I think before that there were birds of a feather meetings, BOFs that we call them, um, but in particular the first working group meeting was July 22, and we've had five meetings, including that one um, since then and up until the most recent one in Prague at ITF 118. All of the presentation slides from the very first uh, IETF 114 working group meeting, um, recordings of the sessions and the minutes, um, so any questions, they're all minuted. They can be found at the particular URL there as well on the data tracker. So in this working group in particular, work is underway to define stub networks and the practices used for, those re yeah, for the reachability between those in your infrastructure networks and discoverability and auto configuration, as is in the title. So 
the draft in there at the moment that's doing this definition, or creating the definition, I suppose, um, it defines a set of practices for connecting stub networks to adjacent infrastructure prefixes. Uh, it notes in particular that stub networks very specifically are stub networks because they are not transit networks. You do not hop across them to get between different infrastructure networks. So they are stubs that hang off of your Wi-Fi, effectively. It requires, particularly within the draft, and it's worth reading actually this, because I think it's actually a very, very particularly well-written draft, um, that these stub networks are interoperable. They're interoperable not just in a two-way fashion for reachability between the stub and infrastructure hosts using IP, reachability of hosts on the internet using IP, and discovery of all hosts via DNS service discovery. So, in particular, I mentioned different working groups. DNS service discovery has its own working group as well associated, which there's a link to further on. Very importantly as well, though, the draft tells us this requires IPv6. There is no good way to do this in IPv4, and they're not going to make one. That's really useful. So, of course, DHCP v6 prefix delegation is in there. That's obviously standardized, as, as Tim mentioned, in the VSOX, v6 ops working group as well. Um, and there are also options defined in this draft for stubborn infrastructure networks to provide NAT64 services to connect back into legacy hosts that may be not capable of running IPv6 and may never, ever be able to capable of doing that. Um, so you either can run NAT64 within your stub router, or you can run NAT64 or additionally run NAT64 in your um, uh, CPE router such that they can connect to internet hosts that are v4. So as I said, there's been some associated work, um, some that's required and some that's also going on in, in different areas of the standards development world, not necessarily at the IETF. Um, I think rather unusually today, there's only one draft within this networking group that's been worked on, but this is actually quite refreshing because usually there's tons of them. Um, so in particular, um, have a quick look at the data tracker if you can. There's a good overview there. Um, you can also join the mailing list for the snack so you can see all the discussion that's happening outside of the meetings. Um, quite a lot of the time, you know, <laughs> going to any form of IETF meeting, there'll be an argument or two perhaps, and then someone says, let's take this to the list heck of a lot of conversation goes on there. So even if you want to just passively watch what's going on, you can do so quite readily. Uh, and there are obviously um, different working groups that are contributing standard work to uh, you know, the end goal of standardizing SNAG. More importantly, I think as well, the Connectivity Standards Alliance is developing certain things that relate to stub networks, in particular matter and thread. And uh, Graham's going to actually be doing a talk about uh, matter in particular um, uh, later on, I think this afternoon, potentially. Um, but there's also new stuff that's coming out all the time. Alero is a new standard that the CSA have started working on. A uh, heck of a lot of that looks um, uh, sort of more secure access, uh, access gateways, locks, various things like that. Um, broadly, this is all, all related to IoT. Um, and of course, you, you know, the IETF needs to support a lot of these efforts. Uh, you could consider joining the CSA as a member. Um, I think BT is a member, um, my employer, so worth doing. In summary, though, um, it's quite a quick run through this. Home networks are going to be changing. I think that's really, really important for us to take home from this. Uh, there will be greater reliance upon having IPv6 in the home. Okay? Some of these things are not going to work without IPv6 ever, and I'm using some really old HTML tags to emphasize that because IPv6 is really old. So you are hereby encouraged to uh, get involved at the ITF. Now, involvement there doesn't mean to say you have to convince your employer to send you around the world. The next, day, <laughs> the next meeting is in Brisbane, very expensive, um, but you know, the one after that will be in North America, the one after that will be in Dublin, which is actually not that far away. Um, as I said before, though, the mailing lists, you can, you can join a subscribe to a mailing list. You won't have to say anything. You can literally observe and see what's going on and read. Um, I think more importantly as well, consider supporting these stub network types in your CPE. If you're developing CPE, think about this thing going forward. If you're not supporting V6 in your CPE, you really need to now. And 
um, all of these IoT devices that are going to get standardized onto Matter and Thread, you know, other types of stub networks where they have their own router and internal management, they're going to need support from your CPE. So please do speak to your vendors if you're procuring CPE at this point. Have they looked at the CSA standards? Have they looked at the SNAP working group? Are they paying attention to the trajectory of connectivity in these environments? And again, we don't want to be in a situation where we have years and years and years of televisions churned out without any IPv6 stack attached to them. So anyway, um, thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Uh, gentleman at the back. I have a question, Tom. Uh, specifically on interoperable. So you made an emphasis that it may be non-Ethernet networks as well that may need to join the mesh or the mess, if you will. So how much emphasis are we putting in terms of interoperability? How do we measure that? How do we know if it'll work? Is that part of the we, standard work? We use the current version of internet protocol addressing. Um, so in general, the, the emphasis is on IP and connectivity between these things. Um, measuring it, um, it in, in effect, it has to work. And I think that's the first and foremost. These things need to be able to discover one another. So I, so I think you answered my question indirectly. It's the IP layers where we kind of tie it oh, all together. Yeah, definitely. definitely. At, at, at the IP layer, we can have... I mean, I, I think back to the way that the ARPANET used to... When we transitioned from the ARPANET to the Internet, it was effectively... The ARPANET was known as the network, and the Internet was the network of networks, effectively. So you're, you're going from that same situation, but you're doing it in the home. Instead of having a network, you're having a network of networks. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Graham's here. He's going to ask me a really interesting question about matter that I can't answer. Probably. <laughs> um, Stub networks are obviously an interesting thing, and, well, so it'll come into some of my talk later, but um, the whole router on a network thing is being done a lot in homes by people who don't understand what's going on, and you're getting these horrible double, triple, quadruple net setups. Are we too late to the party with this, and is there too much information out there on just plugging in with net and relying on it, and how long is it actually going to take for this to have any real impact on what people are doing in their homes. I, to that, I think you need to look at your, your very large equipment vendors. Um, Apple, in particular, Google, in particular. I'm not picking on them in particular, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of suggesting that they, they have devices, they make devices. They, um, there's already support for matter and thread within a lot of these devices anyway. Uh, so. The trajectory is going to be driven by that, I think. When folks come in and they buy this stuff, it's going to be, does your CPE support this, yes or no? Um, I, I think realistically, we'll, as, as, as operators providing uh, you know, home routers and Wi-Fi routers, we're going to have our arm forced a little bit. So I think we need to think about how we catch up. Yeah, I was, I was more just thinking about user doesn't like the Wi-Fi from their, their ISPs. Uh, CPE, they go and buy their own router, plug it in. By default, they'll plug it, plug it in in double NAT. That's, is that something that's being taken into account as a setup? Well, I mean, that's this point here. <laughs> so we, we genuinely need more people to be talking to vendors and pushing in how standards are changing. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the time that you can do that, the only time you can do that is through the RFP you know, procurement process to say to them, do you support these things? Are you tracking these things? Can you support these? And when can you do it? Uh, it's a very difficult conversation to have, but and and suppose you know with third parties like your Zysels, your your AVMs of the world, we have the same issue when we're talking about MAPT support with them. So the more we can talk about it, the better. The more awareness we can raise, the more the benefit will will come. Hopefully. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Um, so yeah, I just uh, emphasise what Tom's saying. There are some very smart people from both Apple and Google taking part in these working group meetings. So that's an indication of, you know, what they see as, as, as its importance. Yeah. I think from my previous involvement in the DNSSD working group, one of the big challenges there was to come up with ways that service discovery can work across different networks within a site, which might be a home network. So that's a very important thing to be able to have the devices in your home 
find each other and communicate with each other without having to go out to a third-party server on the, on the internet. Uh, my question, though, is um, for these stub networks, we've talked here about home networking, but presumably the same devices you can buy and put in your home, you might put on a campus or elsewhere. And are there any considerations or thoughts you might have about putting these things into managed environments rather than the typical unmanaged home environment? I defer to our friend from Meraki, Cisco, over there. I, I think he might have some answers. <laughs> Perhaps we can chat about that. No. So, yeah, so the, the question, Jeffrey, was, um, you know, these, these type of snack uh, stub networks could be deployed into campuses or enterprises, which are managed networks rather than unmanaged ones. Are there any, I don't know whether Meraki have any views on you know, how their equipment would interwork with um, these types of devices? All right, this is being looked at, but not anytime soon. But as we march towards IPv6 only, and you, you will notice later some of these things are IPv6 only, like matter, that will be a necess necessity to, to be looked at. So it won't be that we're going to ignore it. We have to do it. That's correct. Thanks for taking the question, Jeff. Yeah. You see, more reasons to have PD to a device. And draft actually does not say host anymore. It's a device because you cannot differentiate between a host and a router anymore. Very, very specifically, the, uh, the point there about DHCP v6. Second point, and first point, sorry, underneath requires IPv6. Very, very important. So yeah, get involved. Um, Jen's favorite working group. Any more queries? Chap at the back. Can you throw backwards, Jen? Uh, I see why I had to sign up this danger and injury <laughs> form. We haven't had any eyes out yet. Um, very briefly, um, oh, sorry, Seth Tunstall. Um, I noticed in the previous talk as well as yours, you're both talking about DHCPv6. Is there any mention that Google is getting encouraged to support this in Android? Because it's a huge problem. You, you can't make a Wi-Fi network with DHCPv6. Uh, I, <laughs> Considering one of the um, strongest proponents of Android at the IETF is, is I think, the lead author on the uh, prefix delegation in DHCP v6 to devices draft, uh, I, I believe that's a yes. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>